Hello guys, welcome to another Friday live Q&A webinar. This week we're having Tom Rush with us. He's a sculptor and model maker and he's here to talk a little bit about his business, uh, what he does and his passion for it. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, so I'm Tom. Um, I started out in special effects, but I've kind of like transitioned more into designer toys and uh, miniatures now. All oh, right. I know you've uh, you've done a BA in special effects, I believe, mm -hmm. and yeah. then a MA in uh, visual communication. Yeah. How does that work? How does that? How did you link one with another? Um. The, the, yeah. So the special effects was kind of it, the special effects is really really broad. So um, although it seems like a lot of it is prosthetics makeup, it's actually just a fairly core. Um, kind of understanding of molding and casting which uh, which which transposed to like so many other different different things so um from that i kind of like started sculpting monsters and just making a bit of a living from selling to collectors um, okay. and then it kind of like it kind of snowballed from there because i realized that the, the ma was really the ma was a chance for me to build up my business whilst i was studying um, right. So that I could leave the back off of university being like completely independent. When you say so, when you say you were selling uh, models to collectors, what type of models are we talking about exactly? So, like weirdly enough, like a lot of the stuff on on my Instagram and things like that are, are designer toys. But I started out doing quite like realistic stuff, which arguably I prefer because it's more gratifying from an artistic perspective to spend a bunch of time. But you know, there's there's less of a market for that. But there was a small enough market that I was able to um, tap into, quite, kind of. Yeah, I had a little bit of a hardcore like fan base that would would buy like my Wendigo sculptures and oh, right. uh, kind of. Have, have, I don't know if you've seen them. They. I don't think I. I think you've showed them. You showed some of us, uh, some of them to the camera last time hmm. we spoke. They're, uh, they're, they're quite real. They're quite small little things. So they're like kind of busts mainly. Um, and yeah, that was what what I was kind of doing, and I just wanted to expand on that. So at the moment, I know you said you don't have many models around you. Most of the things you do are at your studio at the moment. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, can Can you show us a little bit of what you have around? Anything so, as small as or? I've got um, on my desk because I always have on my desk. I've got one of the spider pumpkins that. Um, oh right. So so that's like one of the uh, like one of the designer toys. Um, so I've been, I've basically been, I've been, I've had that design now for a few years and I've just kind of refined it. Um, and I recently turned him into a 3D print. So like, it's really cool because I can do different sizes of him and it's All the right. exact same model. Um, that's kind of one side of it with the, it's called Heartwood Realm and that's the, the designer toys. Um, and then most recently I've been working on um, weird little, little kind of uh monster in my pocket style toys i'm guessing these ones are yet to be painted yeah so so what i'll do is like with those ones i don't actually paint them with those ones i cast <laughs> them out in a really nice color uh, okay sometimes uh because you know with that with those smaller toys it's not you're not really looking for the, the the paint job as such you're kind of looking just for the fact that they're toys so sometimes i, yep. I cast them in um uh, well, I can't remember what they're called, like thermosensitive, like, um, like pigments. So that okay. when you, like, like when you hold them, they change color. Um, or you can get oh, like right. The like the, the, yeah. the old uh, rings we used to have as children. And, yeah. 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 Like, okay. Like cereal toys and stuff like that. Like that's kind of what they're, um, that's the kind of toy area that they're into. Like that's the nostalgia that they kind of bring, I think. So or Heartwood, people. um, that's your own brand, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Is that yeah. inspired? Um, how, how did you get inspired to do that? Because it um, seems they do look a little bit, um, maybe I would say Tim Burton-ish. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, like, it is that kind of spooky, Halloween-y type vibe. Um, I've always been interested in that. I think that's just something that happens, like, depending on when you grow up. Um, okay. So, like, obviously, like, you know, the night before Christmas, all that kind of stuff. But, like, I've always been into, you know, alien toys, like Mighty Max toys and all that when I was younger. And it's just kind of that's led me artistically towards uh, producing that kind of work. I do think it is in some aspects quite cliche. So I try to step away from just a 
the standard stuff you normally see and try to do something a bit more um, interesting. So like with that, I've got like fish cultists and obviously like pumpkin spiders and, and things. So, so I can't, it, it's artistically, it's really difficult to actually surf this line between what feels like selling out artistically and just doing a cat pumpkin uh, um, uh, uh, or what can be something where you're playing around with a space to make it familiar enough that people will actually want to buy it because they have this familiarity and they recognize it to producing something you artistically feel that uh, you've worked hard on. So I, I find when that quite difficult. Regarding models that people might identify with, um, it's funny you should say that. Do you do, you do uh, video games, uh, I, you know, characters from video games? Um, not personally, but I we I did have a brief stint where I've worked on um, nothing happened with it in the end, but I worked with on a game called I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but there was a game. Um, it was under Epic, but I don't think it, it was one of their little subsidiary companies. But I don't think it was on anymore. Okay. Um, but like, so I don't know what's happening with it. But we we did a bunch of like traditional sculpts that were going to get laser scanned in. Um, and we only got to the concept phase because I think something had happened where uh, the funding had gotten pulled. Um, oh, right. Is that uh, due to so, the lockdown? No, this was a little bit before that. And I can't remember why. Like, they they released a bunch of footage and they weren't happy with where it had gone. Um, nice. And we met them at the at the Brighton... Uh, there's like a, an expo for games. Yep. And we met That's them Comic -Con, there. Comic-Con, sort of. Well, no, it's, it's actually like an industry... Um, expo for like a bunch of people who are like uh, doing their like games on Steam or whatever, and we okay, went, like uh, DreamHack mostly. Uh, yeah, literally, like yeah. people have got their own companies and stuff, and some of them I can't remember how uh, we, we got into it, but we just decided to go there as physical model makers because no one else was, and the sheer amount of like business cards and like interest we got because people either wanted props for their office or you know um, actual physical toys made or things like that. Um, yep. And we just kind of got talking with them and, and um, one thing led to another. And then we just ended up doing a bunch of concept stuff for them, which they were super happy with. And then the funding kind of got pulled. So, I mean, I, I'm sure I'd be fine to talk about it, but it's one of those things of because I think it's still in production, they don't want, um, you know, stuff being said about it. So I don't, I don't Obviously, really know. obviously. Because so we, we did ask them. But, yeah. Sorry. So I was, I was going to say, we did ask them and they said it might come back around um, if they can convince uh, oh, hopefully yeah. we'll get to see some, uh, some yeah, of that stuff. Yeah, it'd be cool. It'd be really cool if they do. Um, so we spoke a little bit about what you do, uh, how your passion, you know, uh, develop over the years. In the podcast, which is yet to be made public due to a uh, few technical difficulties, um, you mentioned that a big part of your decision-making in your early stages was uh, the creative input that you felt wasn't enough, really. You didn't have enough creative input. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? How that did that help? How did yes. that work out? For, for, it was, I, I mean, it was, I didn't do too much um, before I realized that that was the case, to be honest. So I kind of did a bit of freelance, uh, freelance sculpture actually um, was where I kind of ended up. But it was one of these things that when it's client based, you, you, you get so much pushback someone's asking you to be a designer and they don't actually really want you as a designer. They want you as someone who's just going to agree with them. And that happened quite a few times. Um, so I just found that like my first kind of run of work that I did was really cool. And I'd be like, Hey, look, I'm really impressed with, oh, I've got these amazing sketches of this creature or whatever. Um, and then they'd, they'd be like, that's amazing. And then a week later they'd come back and be like, can we make a few changes to it? And then it, it would be something where, I mean, I, I've, I've got photos of stuff, um, but I think the NDA is still like active. But like I did this incredible sketch of this um, kind of like a Yeti with these like massive horns. And like it was it was like these ice warriors and um, they were really interesting. And I hadn't really like I, I tried to be really individual with like how I was you know, showing them off and what I was going to do with a Yeti because it's quite a difficult thing. Everyone's got a preconception as to what a Yeti is. So I was trying to play around with those ideas. And they were like so impressed with what I did. And I was like, man, I can't wait to sculpt this. It's going to be amazing. And then it just ended up and it divulged into this like just weird rock ice monster that I wouldn't show off in a portfolio because it was awful. By the end of it, they were like, yeah, it's still great. But it just kind of shows you they didn't really know what they wanted anyway. And um, 
but the client was I happy think, with it the, the client was happy yeah yeah absolutely like the, the just i wasn't like with what i was what i was outputting and how much time that takes out of your, your personal time um and that, that happened a fair few times um and then a lot of other times it was essentially the mold making and the casting and that gets really repetitive and it's one of those things from an industry perspective if in certainly in special effects if they find out you're good at making a mold you'll never have to like um you'll never be out of work but you will only be doing that like it's really difficult to transition into something else even if you're a great sculptor someone will still want you to make a good mold of something else because it's it's more practical and there's more that kind of hinges on that so i just found that like i, if, I was finding it really difficult to move anywhere other than just doing molding so but I just still, to you've used that uh, income from those odd jobs to uh, yeah. finance your 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 business, Hartwood. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I like other than the um, the grant from um, Futures, I haven't had like any kind of out external stuff. I've managed, I've funded the the studio myself completely, so that's like all the equipment, which was tons of stuff like degassers and pressure casters and just even the space and the amount of tools like i've managed to kind of accrue that which i've been I'm, i'm very proud of being able to do that um so yeah it's been it's been difficult you have to scrimp and save but yeah but for those of you who don't know um tom actually was awarded funding for his business uh can we talk a little bit about that how did that help how did you find applying for the funding oh it, you know it was super easy um i think me personally i was a, i was at a really good stage business wise that i had a lot of um information to kind of back up what i was saying um and there was a lot of like facts and figures that i could kind of throw out so i think um it was the right stage for me to apply for that it wasn't too early um so yeah i was just able to say like hey i you know to move my business on it would be really great if i had a form printer and i'd already been able to experiment with those printers at uni so i kind of knew what i was getting into um, is that what you use uh, the funding for yeah yeah just literally for the form form two um a refurbed form two and do you know what it's been perfect like i've i've printed out maybe i don't know i've printed out an entire range of um of miniatures that's taken me months to kind of take took me months to sculpt And then I printed them all out in the space of about a month. Um, oh, so it was really good. good to like, yeah, it's really good to see everything kind of like exist. It's really difficult when it's digital because it's just. Did, in your did the lockdown affect affect your uh, orders at all? Are you getting yeah, well, more orders or less? Um, I kind of, I in a way, I kind of voluntarily, I was able to close off the shop, so I just I didn't really. I kept it open to what stock I had on hand. Um, And then I just didn't really advertise it or anything. They shut our studio down. Um, so because of that, I couldn't make anything new anyway. So I thought, oh, I'll just sit there and do digital work. So in a way, lockdown, the lockdown has actually been super helpful because I've got, I had the 3D printer here. So it meant that I was able to just print and sculpt and really get my head around the digital side of stuff because I'm still quite new to it. Um, over the last four months so i've kind of like fast tracked my way into to being able to to, to professionally do this this kind of stuff so um silver linings i mean it took a bit of a financial hit you know for, i can uh, imagine but the on the bright side you did get you did get the funding during lockdown i think yeah exactly yeah. so 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 yeah it, it worked out really nice did you find how did you find the presentation for the funding um Yeah, so I did that little video presentation. I thought it was okay. I kind of, I, I, I'm not so um, bad with Premiere Pro, um, so it was it was fairly quick to like mock up. Just something. were you were you anxious at all? Uh, did you have any doubts? Did you think your business plan was well, um, you know, well made? Were you confident um, think, about it? Yeah, I think like arguably I could go back and probably um, fine tune it more because I I did it quite quickly. Um, So I think I could probably go back and kind of, you know, uh, but but yeah, the the business that I was kind of um, putting forward was Dark Heartwood, which was miniatures, and I was basing it on Heartwood Realm, which was designer toys. 
So there's going to be some differences slightly, but I'd already had with that a good testing period of like two years where I've gone through like conventions and online selling and stuff. So I had a pretty good idea as to what to expect um, in terms of that. So, so business plan wise, I would probably still, if I wanted to get a loan or whatever, I'd probably still submit that same plan to like um, a bank. Um, I, was All right. with, I, I was pretty happy with it in that, that terms. But um, would you give any but, advice to uh, students who would be applying for funding in the future? Yeah, I, I mean, like, for, for, I think one of the hardest things is to is to it sounds it sounds hard a bit is to try and know what you don't know, because when you're planning a business, there is so much that actually you're not aware. You know, they, everyone has limitations, um, and if if you're savvy enough, you can do almost all of it yourself. Um, but it's the point is to like know what your actual weaknesses are and what you need to take someone on board to do. And also like how much there is in terms of, um, I'd say like the front end of a business, like it's small things like um, the graphic design stuff that you think is going to be really easy, but that's the, the customer facing aspect of it. And if it's not right, then people don't think you're legitimate. So it's, it, it, everything has to be, to a professional degree if there's one weak link that just means that the other parts will kind of fall and suffer as a result so it's yeah to, to know what you're capable of or, or to network yourself with people that kind of can fill in those those gaps i mean that's, speaking that's of networking well. do you think do you think that networking is a big part of what you do did that help much absolutely but what i would say is that like the, the difference i think what when people go into networking um they have an assumption that the network is is the people who already exist in the industry um and that is the case sometimes absolutely but it's also your your contemporaries and people who are around you that i have gotten i don't really work with or know anyone who is um you know directly in the generation before me and that's not just yeah you know, there's no reason behind that other than the fact that i've kind of grown up industry wise around a bunch of other people um who i didn't necessarily even go to university with you just kind of travel in the same circles and then that's my group of who i kind of work with and go to and that's um you know i know a couple of people at Ardman who are like great mold makers and it's one of those things i know that i can send stuff down to them if i need some like molds made and the same yep. thing with us. And, and we've actually all been in situations where um, uh, like pieces of machinery have broken and we've either sent our work to and someone they else do. Yeah. Or, or like they've come down to our studio to, to use our stuff. And, you know, and, and it's it's surrounding yourself with people who are not only in that industry, but are also really good at it. Um, I think I think like minds attract like minds. And I think if you're really passionate and actually good at what you're doing, you, you attract the same people, um, but it's kind of being open to to, to, to kind of meeting new people is the most important part. Like the designer toy scene has been great because I've met so many people who do exactly the same stuff and to do it to the, a professional degree that we've, you know, we've all got a, like a, a Discord chat where we're throwing ideas around and designs around and problem solving and, and all we talk is shop, but that's great because that's what those friends are for. They're, they're just like shop friends. Yeah, but, um, you did but mention say, you yeah, did mention yeah. the podcast we had that um, you to some point to some extent you consider it uh, the best approach would be to be a little bit obsessed about your your um, your work really mm -hmm. uh, to know everything that's going on around you and to know what everyone else is doing really when you say that you would like to know what everyone else is doing at all times is that from a competitive point of view or inspirational point of view or both. You know, I'd, I'd say that it's like, for me, there's no malicious competitive. It's always like a friendly competitive thing. Like, because, you know, all the, I've, I've used the designer toy artists as, as a great example. Like, we go to uh, all the convention together. Everyone knows each other. Every artist there knows each other. Um, and we're literally directly competing with each other in, like, in terms of how much money we're making, like, because people go there with a certain amount of money in their pockets and they can't spend everything equally on everyone. So so there are people that will earn more, but then we'll go down to the pub at the end of the day um, and celebrate. So it's like, 
there's there's a competition but none of us are malicious or want someone else to fail as a result so i think it mainly is down to to inspiration um and i think you see other people working and you're like man i could i could do that i I could do it like but i could do this and make it like even better and then i'm sure that they think the exact same thing with (laughs) what i produce when they say man that's good but i know how to like knock it up to the next stage and yeah, it fine. goes the same in, in all all domains, really. Music as well. If you, mm-hmm. uh, there were some some jokes about guitarists that you you know you show someone something on guitar and they immediately think like I could do that better. But <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. But but I Fair think that's a, that's a perfectly healthy way to to kind of you know because you're not you're not saying someone is bad. You're just super inspired by what they're doing and and that opens more doors for you and hopefully like you get to the point where you're doing that for other people as well. Do you do you criticize your work a lot? Oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Do you feel like that is a uh, a quite key element to your development? Yeah, I think that like I, I know that's something that that can cause um, people to like stop or or you know stagnate and and kind of not want to get past certain things, but like. I'm super critical about everything that I do, but I still enjoy it because you're not, I think that the thing is, is to fall out of love with the outcome of what you're producing. Because if you consider, um, there's, there's an artist uh, called Beeple underscore crap. He's really good, but he's been doing um, a, a piece of work every day for the past 12 years. Oh, uh, wow. And, yeah. And you know, and, and like I watched an interview with him and, and something he said like kind of like made a lot of sense where he said each piece of artwork is important yeah but it's not really because the overall artwork is the fact i've been doing it 12 years every day so it doesn't matter what i'm producing it just matters that i am and um you know so each piece that i produce is literally going to be what like one eight thousandth of a career of like actually producing artwork um so i kind of view it like that so i you know like a, a, a great example is like I finished the sculpture, fully cast it, painted it and everything. And, uh, and I had a photographer um, to come down and photograph it. And he broke it before um, before it got photographed. So it never got recorded, not properly. Um, he, he took some photos. And he was like, I can Photoshop the teeth back in. And I was like, no, don't worry about it. But like, I think that was when I really actually realized that the process was far more valuable to me than the outcome. Um, because I wasn't upset or I didn't even care that that thing had kind of broken because that in a way was old news because I, I could see a bunch of flaws in that sculpture. And I was like, the next one's going to be even better than that one. But, but I wasn't um, heartbroken that like, you know, two weeks, three weeks of work had just kind of disappeared because mentally it already had anyway, because I knew I was able to do something better afterwards because I'd learned a lot. Um, yeah. I, and I, I do think people struggle to to kind of hit that flow, but it, it does come and it comes with just repetition. So it's kind of ignoring uh, it being critical, but ignoring the fact that you're critical about the end thing. You have to be critical about how you're getting there. If that makes sense. Yeah. So your artistic side uh, is your drive, really. That pushes you mm-hmm. forward. Yeah. It's okay. funny because you don't like, I think people also like have a preconception as well with, with artists where, you're sitting there and you're going, man, this is great. I love what I'm doing, but you don't, you kind of don't really think about it. Like you, you only do the artwork because you can't not do it. You get really, I get, I, I personally get really like antsy and kind of like frustrated if I'm not sitting there making something, but I'm not necessarily in love with the, the process when I'm doing it. It's more just concentration. And um, I think the only thing that I genuinely feel is that, at certain points in like a sculpture, I get a little bit of a rush where I go, oh, I can tell this is going to be good when I finish it. But that's just like like the briefest of like three seconds throughout the whole two weeks yeah, of sculpture yeah. or something. But but yeah, it's just that like, it's it's just something you can't not do rather than something you love doing, which is, is, is kind of strange, I, I think. All right. And how, how did you... Obviously, you at some point you've realized all these these little things that uh, you probably had to learn the hard way. Really, um, did that happen during university years? Yeah, do you know, like, so I started sculpting. The first thing I ever sculpted, I think, was like six years ago. Okay. Um, I I kind of got a bit fed up with my 
a, a job. It was not even really IT. It was just kind of like a learning resources type deal at school. And um, it was so boring. And then I just decided that uh, I've done a little bit of sculpting recently. I'll go and do special effects. That was quite literally it. Um, and then those three years were just this uh, kind of, I just realized that I needed to build a portfolio. So I just got really into like, just continually producing work. Like I was producing like two sculptures, I think a month, um, certainly in second year anyway. And I just took it seriously because I knew that I, I knew what the alternative was. And the alternative was really boring and mundane and I didn't want to go back to that kind of job. Um, and I'd always been a little bit creative in terms of like sketching and drawing, but never to a professional level, like ever. Um, but applying myself after that and actually making it a conscious um, effort, like the professionalism of the work kind of changed. It literally in the space of a year, it went from really, really amateur and kind of really kind of bad um, to within about a year to being something that like would be acceptable professionally. Um, Just to mention, all, really all those bad projects are still on your Instagram. Oh yeah, right? you can scroll right back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really funny because like, I think what, what the difference is, is I figured out how, well, not figured out, I, I, I researched a lot of artists and I learned how to paint um, with a sense of realism. And I, you know, I don't actually do that that much anymore. Um, but certainly there was this point where the sculptures were kind of badly painted and all of a sudden they were very lifelike. And it's because I figured out like translucencies within like resins and then like using acrylic washes and kind of um, just a couple of techniques that really brought out this like sense of realism in them. And that's when it kind of started to snowball because I think there was a feedback of loop of getting really positive results and going, man, I want to do that again. I want to do that again. So I just ended up doing, I don't know, like 20 odd sculptures of like creatures. I don't even think all of them are on Instagram. There's too, too many, but um, I've got a, which, a document. Of all of them. Which artists inspire you the most? Um, I, I think there's a guy called Aries Colacontes, who is really good. Um, his work in terms of, there's a stylization to it but it's, it's incredibly realistic and it's really small as well. And I kind of like that alien concept design stuff. There's a, a guy, I'm going to pronounce his name wrong as well, but um, there's a, I think he's Polish. I think he's called uh, Tomek Razdowix and he's right. really good. He's, he's, he's an, he's another kind of like creature sculptor, except he didn't start out that way. He started out as a traditional sculptor and then, kind of found his way to just doing little monster heads and that snowballed but you can see you can go back on his instagram and see when he was bad at it when he was doing really yeah. naff zombie sculptures and now he's doing really beautiful like um i don't know like snail demons or whatever but but they're really interesting like artistically like he makes a lot of cool choices um and there's the classics like geordie shell and all that like um i think geordie shell is like his work ethic and his and the way that he works is is really inspiring but i tend to take a few bits from different people as to what I like about their approach because artistically even if someone isn't they don't produce work in the style that you you like there are still aspects of how they maintain this like how may, they maintain their professionalism that are really um you know aspiring or inspiring all right and for for those of us uh, those of you watching out there who are uh, looking forward to become sculptors and model making i'm sure you're wondering uh, Tom, can you give us a little bit about? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, materials you use and software? Okay. Any so, preferences? Um, so at the minute, like if we go by like the digital side of stuff, um, so I am using ZBrush. I'm actually using ZBrush Core, which is like the most basic version. And I think as, if if you're a student, you can get it fairly cheap. Um, I think you, even that it's not expensive. It was like 140, I think, for, for when I got it. Um, yeah. And in terms of like miniatures, like Z the real ZBrush does all the movie stuff, but because I'm producing things that are like, I don't know, 10 centimeters tall maximum, um, you don't really need to, to go too deep into the software to be able to do that. So ZBrush call works for minis. Um, and then obviously for the, the output, I'm using a form too, but I did learn on an AnyCubic Photon because that was a cheaper alternative to learning how to 3D print. I think they've got a All sale right. on at the minute and they're like 150 quid, which is nothing for a 3D printer. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so then I take them to my studio where I'm just using like silicones, which there are, 
hundreds of types for all these different purposes. Sometimes you want softer ones, sometimes you want harder ones, uh, yeah. or sometimes you want a combination of both, depending on which parts of the mold are which. Um, and with molding, there's like a million different ways to mold anyway, you know, you, the case molds, the, the um, matrix molding, and then just like simple one part, two part, uh, you know, and it could even be like harder molding. And yeah, there's a whole science about that. Um, and then you did then, mention something about a zombie dragon, which was made out of 16 pieces or 17. Yeah. Pieces. So that like, that was the, <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. I'm, I'm, he's on my desk to, to cast or to mold out because he's got 16 different parts. Um, so that was made in ZBrush uh, digitally. Um, and then I kind of knew before, like in the design process, how I wanted the dragon to, to be. And as a result of that, I was able to separate the pieces before I started sculpting. So I was able to sculpt the separate pieces and then kind of mesh them together in ZBrush, um, which meant I could print them out all individually. So um, what's quite difficult with miniatures is understanding how the resin works. And because I've done so much in the past couple of years with like just designer toys and even traditionally sculpted things have been casting them out, you get this kind of like spider sense as to how resin will flow around a mold. So it's with that you kind of then can design the miniatures in a way that you know how to cast individual parts of them. Um, it's, yeah, it's a bit it's a bit tricky because there's no hard and fast rule. Yep. With, you know, it, to go in there and expect to be able to sculpt a miniature like that's quite complex without doing it all traditionally first, I, I, it'd be really hard to do. Um, I, I do. I wouldn't have been able to. I, it's 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 learning it over like a long period of. of and the, the resin flow uh, that affects the air bubbles as well, which you don't yeah. really want, is it? Yeah. So so um, I, I I pressure cast things, which means you take the silicone into a um, a degassing unit to take all the air out of it, and then once you've made up your mold or you've clayed up the mold and and done whatever with it, you um you pour that silicone and and then you essentially with that mold you put it in a pressure caster so you're pouring some resin into like a small area of it or sometimes there's injection systems or even it depends what you're doing but um that mold gets put under pressure whilst it's curing in a chamber uh, yep. sorry the, the casting is, is cured under a chamber and that either forces air bubbles out or it forces them to become basically microscopic most of the time um and you tend to get much nicer castings as a result of that. Uh, some people always say like, why don't you just put it in the, the, the degasser? Um, and it's to do with like uh, undercuts and the speed at which it needs to happen. Like pressure and uh, vacuums work very differently. So you tend to just pressure cast resin. You can degas it, not, but, but for the size, it's much easier to actually pressure cast it. Um, okay. So yeah, it's it's very noisy and messy, and you have to wear a lot of hazard stuff. But um, but it's and also for for those of you who are wondering how how come Tom knows so much, he's actually an associate lecturer as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You you teach um, you teach is it makeup or fashion? yeah, it's it's weird. It's uh, it's I teach um the fashion, but I'm I primarily do the special effects, um, makeup stuff with them. Um, and then the new course as well that's 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 going opening up in September will be um, special effects and prosthetics design. So I'm teaching on that yeah. as well. So you'll be able to see Tom quite often through the campus. Uh, don't be shy to say hi. Yeah. Um, and also, if you have any other questions uh, regarding sculpting and model making, because obviously he's an educator. That's why I let him speak so much. <laughs> uh, but um, also regarding, can we just go a little bit back to funding mm -hmm. as well yeah. um you've used that to uh, buy a, a second printer is it or yeah so so i started off with the with the photon um which it's just a printer to learn on um and, and although okay. it's fine to produce toys it didn't really have the it wasn't a workhorse in an industrial sense i couldn't sit there and run it every day without fail and the detail it produces was slightly more rounded than the detail that the form two produces. Um, right. So the funding I used was was for like something that could produce professional miniatures. 
Fair enough. Uh, just wanted to make that clear for anyone who would like to apply for a printer uh, for mm -hmm. funding. There you go. We've had a, a student a few, a couple of months ago, actually, SD Boland, if you know her. Um, she makes little miniatures for, um, I forgot what the name is called. It's a video game. Uh, yeah. And she, where you can customize your own character, and she basically takes people's characters and then turns them, you know, into little miniatures for yeah. them, which is great, That's really. Great. Um, and she, exactly the same thing. She uh, applied for funding. She was awarded the funding, and she got a second printer. <laughs> so yeah. apparently, having more printers does help a lot. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, as well, is like you don't have to go in blind because the uni has a fair few. Have they have? four i think four form twos is that accessible um, to all students or yeah yeah it is it is um you have to go through the, sh the shop and so there's a whole bunch of like information on there but but essentially you kind of like buy the resin so that they're, they're done at cost which i'm um, which is really cheap compared to how much it would be if you had to do that externally okay so there you go you can make your own models in uni just pay for the re resin and mm -hmm. at a pretty cheap rate so, yeah, yeah, another another good thing. Um, I was going to say, does that include? Do you have to have training on that? Do you know what? It's actually it's it, the form twos are so plug and play that um, you you have to download the software, but once you upload your model into the software, it pretty much tells you if it's going to work or not, and and it will guide you through that process. And if the software okay. is, is is fine, gives you the green light. You just upload it to the printer and press print, and then it does it. Um, oh, okay, so it's quite it, really, yeah, fairly really straightforward. Is, yeah, it's really nice to use compared to the photon, which was like, I'm not level. I'm going to turn off randomly, or like, yeah, right, it was a nightmare. But but learning on stuff like that that is a nightmare is really helpful. But I'm guessing those are common problems that everyone will encounter at some point if they're using the same machinery, isn't it? Yeah, I think that like that there's you know the fact that there's a difference in price between a form two and um, a, 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 the the form two is ten times the price of a of a photon, um, right? So yeah, a photon is something that's all it needs to do is to move up and down with a z axis, and then there's yeah. an LCD screen underneath it that kind of uh, an uh, uh, an ultraviolet light cures each layer of resin, and the screen basically blocks out the shadow uh, that doesn't yeah. get cured. Um, so it's a super simple bit of, of tech, but like the firmware and the because it's all free and because it's not necessarily funded by a big, huge company like Formlabs, it's just not hugely up to scratch. So there's a lot of tinkering that needs to be done. But by tinkering, you learn what you're what's going wrong. And, you know, it's 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 much nicer to mess up a printer that would cost you like 50 quid to fix than one that you have to send off to a company to, to true, true. service less painful as well yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> well all right then would you just to wrap it up um would you have any advice for students who are willing to you know follow the same steps as you did um uh, maybe set up a business in model making maybe create their own brand as well having their own vision any yeah creative think, creative advice for that i think it's to really it's to I know it's what it's hard. It's what I said before about being aware what what um, you don't know, but I think that's really vital because I, you know I, I teach that I teach um, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. It's not off the top of my head. I, I teach like the uh, the portfolio and the business side of stuff, and and a lot of my students want to go into to doing their own thing, um, mainly like makeup stuff. But yeah, it's knowing like what exactly is out there and um everything about running a business so so creatively i think even if you put the creative stuff aside it's having a really good working knowledge of every part of the business from the marketing aspects of it to um how you're presented the the social media and all that kind of stuff it, it sounds really like obvious but until you sit there and realize that you don't have like a title card for videos or something like that you know it's that's the spanner in the works because then you're like man i need to get someone to animate like a title card so my videos look really like professional and that yeah. might be something you hadn't thought about or, or um you're gonna it's gonna be difficult to acquire that funding or you're gonna have to learn to do it yourself and 
you know, music and photography and um, everything like that is 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 hard. But then also from a creative perspective, you need to have work that people are actually wanting to buy. Like to make it in terms of, of a business, it's I think it's a good thing to um, trust your kind of instinct and your your style, as it were. But um, also be very aware of like what the kind of current trends are. Like miniatures at the minute are really big, and I don't think that's going to really go away it's, for a while. Anyway, it's been something that's building up. But I know that in a couple of years, the three D printing side of stuff is is going to be so advanced that it's just going to be the sale of, well, not just, but it, there's going to be an increasing sale of just digital files because it's already big now. Um, so it's only going to be, get bigger and bigger as more people have access to better printers. So the software uh, side of it uh, will definitely grow exponentially within yeah. the next year. I'm, I'm, so. I'm sure because like it's already come so far now. Like you just think, you know, ten years ago this would have been a pipe dream. There's no way that I could have sat there and thought that I could produce every aspect of what would require tens of thousands of pounds of hundreds of thousands of pounds of equipment and tens of thousands of pounds of budget just to produce uh, miniatures. You know, the only way you could have done it would be producing little metal ones or whatever. But if you wanted to do like plastic injection molding, forget about it. And the other day, like a company um, appeared on my Instagram where they've got injection molding machines for 40 grand. I know 40 grand is a ton of money, but like it would cost you 20 grand to just get one of those things produced in a factory in China. And then you only have that. So for twice the price, you can do it permanently yourself here. So yeah. the production quality, like, you know, that, that, that comes down and down and it becomes more accessible. So you kind of have to stay on top of it. Um, so that's, you know, when I'm saying about being obsessed with everything going on around you, that's knowing stuff like that as well. And, and, and keeping your, your finger on the pulse with what your industry is doing is really important but um, right. but yeah creatively is is that's that's a difficult one people i think are interested in people so if you're the face of your business you kind of need to be it's it needs to like be obvious that you're doing all this kind of stuff yourself or, or you um, did mention that personality appeals more to people than actual skill i think so yeah because i like i've I, I look through Instagram and Reddit. Reddit's the worst one for it, actually. But um, where there's a lot of a lot of people who are producing work that I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable selling because it's very basic. But um, but people buy it. People really like it, and I think that's mainly because they have a, in in a way a relationship with that artist. And um, it certainly is that with the designer toys. People will buy from from Hartwood Realm because they meet us at conventions. Um, you know, and they see us on videos and there's a bit of a personality to, to it. But um but yeah, so so I think you can get away with actually being fairly uh lower skilled. I don't want to like be too mean about other artists, but you can you don't have to be this kind of Simon Lee or Geordie Shell like god tier like level of skill to actually make money from from your artwork. Um because yeah. there are people out there that everyone's always on a on a, on a scope. There's always gonna be someone better than you. Um, just as there's always going to be people un underneath you and you're that person that people go, wow, I wish I could do that. Or, you know, and there's going to be people who look at your work and say, no, it's not that good. But, the, you know, if it's selling, it's selling. So you just kind of ride that. Yeah. So there you have it, guys. Another week with uh, very similar conclusions to past weeks. Basically, networking is key. Personality, be a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, creative side, be obsessed with your work. Keep doing it. Don't worry about the uh, if it if it if how, how you said basically let yourself fall out of love with it so you can uh, move forward and also as we keep saying business side of things very important never <laughs> never think you know enough about business uh, speaking of we have some upcoming filler sessions with uh, Nikki Curtis for business for those of you who are watching who would like some more insight of how starting up your own business works. But yeah, there we have it. Thank you, Tom, for joining us today. And thank, uh, you. thank you, everyone, for watching. And I'll see you guys next week.